Pressing a button at Washington, President Roosevelt stopped the construction of the $75 million San Francisco-Oakland Bridge in California, providing work for thousands of men. It is an honor to initiate the construction of the greatest bridge ever built, the largest construction job undertaken in the United States this year, the bridge between San Francisco and Oakland because it brings additional employment to thousands of men and women who are getting the material ready and to another six or seven thousand more people who will work directly on the job of construction. I think we can well say that this huge undertaking, which is to be followed by many other useful improvements through the medium of the public works program, symbolizes the upturn that is, has come to our industrial life in the United States. Now we take you behind the scenes with the press to interview General Johnson, Roosevelt's administrator for industrial recovery. What practical results can you suggest as having resulted so far from this act? Well, well for one thing, the textile code is approved by the president abolishes child labor. That's something this country has been trying to do for 25 years. It was possible to do because under the president's plan, where everybody can do the same thing together, it was not at all difficult to do. That's one thing. Also, in respect of the textile code, if that's approved, it'll restore about 1,929 purchasing power to workers in the textile industry. Uh, will you explain how the consumer will be safeguarded against unduly high retail prices which may follow these uh, Industrial well, of course, if costs go up, prices have got to go up, but we don't want them to go up any faster than costs go up. And if we find extortionate practices, we step in and either cancel or modify the code. And if the code is taken away, uh, those who were formerly parties to it are subject to all of the penalties of the Sherman Act. <laughs> At campfires throughout the country, members of the Civilian Conservation Corps were inspired by the stirring message from President Roosevelt. Men of the Civilian Conservation Corps, in speaking to you tonight, I am thinking of you as a visible token of encouragement to the whole country. You are evidence that we are seeking to get away just as fast as we possibly can from the dole to get away from free lodging houses, to get away from soup kitchens, because the government is paying you wages and maintaining you to do actual work. Work which is needed now and for the future. Work that will bring a definite, financial, practical return to the people of the nation in the future. Through you, the nation will graduate a fine group of strong young men, clean living, trained to self-discipline, and above all, willing and proud to work for the joy of working. That, my friends, must be the new spirit of the American future. And you are the vanguard of that new spirit. John Roosevelt, youngest son of the president, enjoys his vacation at the Lyle Phillips Polo Ranch. Here he is coming out of the stable after saddling his pony. John's a regular That's fellow, and the youngsters seem to take to him. Here you are. Now you take these out. Out of boy. That's then after picking the proper mallet, he mounts his pony and starts out for the polo field. Learning the game isn't as easy as it looks, but John Come gets on, right boy. in there and plays with the best of them. Tearing down the field under the direction of Coach Phillips. They say he's got the makings of a first-rate poloist. He loves the game and hopes to become a ten-goal man, showing the same fight as his distinguished father. We have built a granite foundation in a period of confusion. That foundation of the federal credit stands there broad and sure. It is the base of the whole recovery plan. Congress did its part when it passed the Farm and the Re Industrial Recovery Acts. 
And today we are putting those two acts to work. And they will work if people understand their plain objectives. It is time for courageous action. And the recovery bill gives us the means to conquer unemployment with exactly the same weapon that we have used to strike down child labor. The proposition is simply this. If all employers will act together to shorten hours and to raise wages, we can put people back to work. No employer will suffer because the relative level of competitive cost will advance by the same amount for all of them. But if any considerable group should lag or shirk, this great opportunity will pass us by and we will go into another desperate winter. This must not happen. The principle that applies to the employers applies to the workers as well. And I ask you workers to cooperate in the same spirit. That is why I am asking the employers of the nation to sign this common covenant with me, to sign it in the name of patriotism and in the name of humanity. That is why I am asking the workers of America to go along with us in a spirit of understanding and of helpfulness. Well, dear, it looks as if we have the right man in the White House. He's surely leading the country back to better times. He certainly is. The Executive Committee of the Business and Advisory Council, Chairman Gerard Pope, tells their plan. The reports coming in show that many thousands of people have been put back to work and wages and salaries have been increased in the effort to restore purchasing power. President William Green of the American Federation of Labor. We all hope the emergency plan proposed by the president will prove to be a complete success. General Hugh S. Johnson, recovery administrator. The president's reemployment drive and the National Recovery Act gives this country the greatest chance that any country ever had to pull itself out of a tight place. The J.C. Penney Company, employing 21,000 people, has, through its president, wired the administration pledging prompt 100% cooperation in the National Industrial Recovery Program. We shall cooperate wholeheartedly throughout our 1,478 stores throughout the 48 states. Warren Brothers, the largest road builders in the country, emphatically endorse the President's National Recovery Act. In fact, we are right now busy on a code of fair practice for the paving industry to be presented to the administrator in Washington. On behalf of Remington Rand and its 10,000 employees, I have pledged full support to President Roosevelt in his industrial recovery program. Everyone should recognize that increased payroll means increased purchasing power. We have steadily added more workers and shall continue to do so. The International Business Machines Corporation is putting forth every effort to extend full cooperation to President Roosevelt's plan. I believe the President's plan is reasonable and workable. The Gillette Razor Company stands squarely behind the President in his efforts to increase the purchasing power of the nation. We have adopted his voluntary code and we urge all other employers to do likewise. Roosevelt's National Recovery Act has brought forth the pledge of millions to aid his program, the pledge to follow his leadership and the pledge to bring back prosperity. On leaving Washington for the summer White House in Hyde Park with Mrs. Roosevelt, the president turned over the administration of his gigantic program to General Hugh S. Johnson. Seems as though the whole country had risen as one man to carry the president's requirements into execution. Secretary of Labor Perkins urges your cooperation. Uh, purchasing power of the workers will be and must be increased. We shall see the results of this new conception which we are thinking of in terms of the New Deal. Ernest T. Weir, leading Pittsburgh steel magnate. The steel industry stands squarely behind the president in his great work toward national industrial recovery. 
A wage increase of 15% has recently been made, amounting to about $5 million per month additional distribution, which is immediately transferred into increased buying power and results in additional employment for thousands of workers in other lines of activity throughout the United States. Steel production is the backbone of industry, the road to prosperity and the barometer of recovery. As steel goes, so goes the nation. Hours are going down, wages are going up, and more than a million working men are back on the job. Every day, new factories report increased payrolls and added labor. Every day sees an increase of car loadings and shipping. You and I are beginning to spend. The man across the street has a new car. These are the things that indicate better times and show that under Roosevelt's leadership, America is going forward. America is lining up behind the NRA. Newspapers from metropolitan dailies to country weeklies. Banks, big and small. Furniture stores everywhere, barber shops, the clothing industry, small retail establishments, nationwide agencies, and the theaters are giving their support. And now here the NRA spokesman for the motion pictures, Sal Rosenblatt. Every group in the motion picture industry has pledged the president, through me as the deputy administrator in charge of the motion picture industry code, that not only will the motion picture industry immediately write and enforce its own code under the National Recovery Administration, but will extend every facility from every group and division to enforce all of the codes under the National Recovery Administration. In the coal mines, the NRA has inaugurated a new era. After a strike that threatened the entire eastern coal area, 20,000 miners returned to work, expressing faith in Roosevelt. The New Deal has given us a square deal, and we're all back to work, and we hope we may be able to continue so without any outside interference. And to convey a message of hope, Postmaster General Farley issues the first NRA emergency stamps. General Johnson, how do you like the design? It's great, and we fully appreciate the cooperation of yourself and your department. Do you believe it typifies the spirit of the NRA? It does fully, but I miss the Blue Eagle. We will arrange for that later, General. Start the press. 400 million stamps on their way to inspire America to go forward to prosperity with Roosevelt. The spirit of 1933. Virginia. Inspiring his forest army by a personal visit, President Roosevelt makes his first tour of the Civilian Conservation Corps camps in the Shenandoah Valley. After inspecting Skyland, the Commander-in-Chief takes a seat at the head of the table to eat with the boys, and he enjoys every bite of the plain, wholesome food furnished at the camp. It's very good to be here at these Virginia CCC camps. I wish I could see them all over the country. I hope that all over the country they're in as fine condition as the camps that I've seen today. I wish that I could take a couple of months off from the White House and come down here and live with them because I know I'd get full of health the way they have. The only difference is that they've put on an average of about 12 pounds apiece since they got here, and I'm trying to take off 12 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> After signing the NRA Steel, Oil, and Lumber Code, President Roosevelt comes home for a brief visit. His daughter, Mrs. Anna Dahl, and her children, Sisty and Buzzy, meet him at the train. Delighted to see their distinguished grandfather, the children join him in the car with Mrs. Dahl. 
the president takes Sisti on his lap, and then the happy group rides away, headed for Hyde Park and a Roosevelt family reunion. scouts of the 10 Mile River Camp, New York, make their guest a big chief, and the president proves he is a good scout. <laughs> is it on straight? <laughs> Fellow members of the Boy Scouts of America, I haven't been here for two years. All sorts of things have happened up here in, in that time. And when you come right down to it, the NRA is based on the same fundamentals that scouting is based on. In other words, trying to do something for the other fella and not trying to do somebody. It's based on cooperation. You know what that means? based on the spirit of service and it's going to work just like scouting has worked <laughs> President Roosevelt attends the Dutchess County Fair horse show to see his son John there he is, riding to victory. And young John put his mouth through its paces like a veteran horseman. Then John and his sister, Mrs. Curtis Dahl, competed as a pair while the president looked on. And together, they finished fourth. In another event, young John won the blue ribbon with his horse, New Deal, Roosevelt's favorite. Visiting Camp Smith, New York, President Roosevelt inspects the National Guardsmen and reviews the 71st and 174th Infantry Regiments. Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York, Mr. Roosevelt urges his neighbors of Dutchess County to work for good government. The national government must, of course, think in terms of a rounded whole. But your responsibility, your interest in national government, oughtn't to stop there. The greater part of government, as it affects your daily lives and mine, is your local government. And the opportunity in this field of local government for improvement, for betterment that will be felt in your lives is just as great as it is in Washington. Returning to Washington aboard Astor's yacht Norma Hall, President Roosevelt poses with his grandchildren. A big crowd was on hand to see the president leave, and among those who waved goodbye to him from the dock was his mother, Mrs. Sarah Delano Roosevelt, and his daughter, Mrs. Curtis Dow. The size of the yacht worries Roosevelt's grandson, Buzzy. How could he get into another bridge, Mommy? The other bridge is very high. <laughs> Brought back to the White House by the Astor Yacht Norma Hall, President Roosevelt immediately took the helm of the ship of state. 
With his arrival in Washington, the chief executive ended his vacation as guest of Vincent Astor to personally direct the progress of the NRA. Ready to deal with the nation's problem, the president looked eager to get to work, refreshed by his crew. How was your vacation, Mr. President? What? How was your vacation? <laughs> with 1,500,000 volunteers helping to mobilize the NRA consumers, the president was delighted to learn that the housewives of America are lining up solidly behind him, doing their part by patronizing the Blue Eagle. In purchasing my supplies for my home, I consider it a duty of every woman to support the NRA. I always look for the Blue Eagle. I think the NRA is a wonderful opportunity for us women. We spend 85 cents of every dollar which goes into the home. With our united support, it cannot fail. We women enjoy shopping in the NRA shop because we feel while we are doing so that we have the greatest opportunity since the war of doing our part in this great campaign. of state and you who are the the leaders in this cause for the alleviation of human needs as you know the many governments in the United States the federal government the 48 government and the tens of thousands of local governments are doing their best to meet what has been, in many ways, one of the most serious crises in our history. It's the fact that people with property have been getting more from rents. There have been fewer defaults on mortgages and bonds and various other kinds of investments. People are not so worried about the banks. And I believe today that you can go forth I won't say in the spirit of the NRA because you don't come under it. All of you are going to work a great deal more than 40 hours a week. And I want to tell you that you are hereby absolved. <laughs> that if you want to work 70 hours a week, God bless you, go and do it. <laughs> Last winter, under the leadership of President Roosevelt, Congress created the Tennessee Valley Authority to operate Muscle Shoals. We plan to salvage the wartime investment so that the plant shall no longer be a burden on the American taxpayer. We have just announced proposed rates, which after covering comparable expenses of private power enterprises, will provide electricity for homes and farms at a maximum rate of three cents and an average rate of two cents a kilowatt hour. Cheap power, however important, is but a part of the great project as it was conceived by President Roosevelt. The authority is directed and empowered to aid and to stimulate the planned development of vast natural resources and industries of this great region comprising seven states. Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi, an area almost as large as England in which live two million men, women, and children. The methods which may be developed in the Tennessee Valley Authority for stimulating the natural resources of an area in an orderly way will doubtless be applied to other regions of our country. New York. President Roosevelt receives an ovation as he rides through the city, seated in the car with Miss Marguerite Lahand, his secretary, and Mrs. James Roosevelt. Before going to Hyde Park for a brief stay, the president sped to his townhouse, accompanied by a heavy escort of motorcycle police. His arrival resulted in a family reunion, 
and he remained in the city long enough to confer with friends and say goodbye to his eldest son, James, who was sailing abroad. And here are Mr. and Mrs. James Roosevelt sailing for Europe with the First Lady and the President's mother, Mrs. Sarah Delano Roosevelt, who accompanied them to the dock to bid them bon voyage. A happy couple, Betsy and Jim, real Roosevelt's, for the continent as unofficial ambassadors of goodwill. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of your ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. Swiftly, the menace of war grew into dread reality as American ships and ships carrying American citizens were torpedoed, sent to the bottom by the ruthless campaign of the unseen tigers of the sea, the submarines. And finally the day came when Franklin Roosevelt's chief, President Woodrow Wilson, sadly and reluctantly set his hand and seal to the declaration of war. From the Army cantonments, our boys marched aboard the transports assembled and prepared by the Secretary of the Navy, Josephus Daniels and his active and enthusiastic young aide, Franklin D. Roosevelt. His work was so valuable that the president sent him to France, where he put the big naval 12-inch guns on military trains to battle back the Germans at Verdun. Fireless as ever. The young assistant secretary witnessed every phase of the war, following its course from disarbation docks through the munitions works in the great shipyard. Roosevelt ardor, he went to the front, met the great Marshal Foch, and saw with his own eyes and heard with his own ears the savage onslaughts of the Germans against the Allies, and the Allies against the Germans. The baptism of fire for the young Spitz.
The American punch counted. War-weary Germans surrendered in droves. The end was near at hand. And finally, on that unforgettable November the 11th, the blessed armistice came to the trenches. The triumphant legions of the Allies and the AEF swept back from the hard-won fields of victory. And over the whole world rose a pean and clamor of hysterical joy at the end of the horrible struggle. Paris, London, New York. Who could ever forget that surging, glorious day of celebration in New York City? From tip to tip of Manhattan Island, the streets were jammed from curb to curb by people utterly abandoned to joy. It was unbelievable, incredible, dazing and dazzling. It was the American spirit, unchained and soaring. Something to be seen once in a century. But victory is not all celebration. Hard work was yet to be done at home and abroad. The president desired to bring about a just peace which would not carry the seeds of future war. In high hope he went to France with our great commanding General John J. Pershing at his side. He reviewed a full division of crack troops at Chaumont, General Pershing's headquarters. And once more Franklin Roosevelt found himself in France, this time to clean up the debris of war. The AEF was coming home now, its work well done. With song and cheering, they piled aboard the home bound transports, while Assistant Secretary Roosevelt directed the sale and dispersal of naval supplies and cleaned up in his thorough style. Finally, Pershing and the boys were back, Black Jack heading the greatest and finest army that ever assembled under the stars and stripes. And how a million people roared acclaim that thundering day of the great victory parade in New York City. Presently, there came crowding upon his mind all of the pressing problems that he must meet, the problems of the day. What to do about the millions out of work, those in need? None knew better than he the plight of those who stood patiently in the bread lines, dull with discouragement, with hardly enough spirit left to walk the treadmill of their misery. None comprehended more clearly than he that the time had come for action to relieve the necessities of men and women whose only desire was to get the work that did not exist. While he rested, got ready to retire from the governorship, his keen mind was at work on the problem of all these unfortunates, driven to idleness, precarious peddling, and to accepting the charity of people in the street. Times were becoming more and more troublesome. There was agitation on every side. Prohibition agents were raiding liquor selling places and destroying illegal beer. New York's great population was aroused. And the symbol of that feeling was a great beer parade in New York City. Marched all day and far into the night, 150,000 people in line. Some folks were saying that the Statue of Liberty needed a glass of beer to cheer her up. She certainly doesn't look her old self in this picture. At night, and perhaps a little inside information of what was to take place on April 7, 1933, gave her a more agreeable aspect. The big girl down the bay was gazing, one must suppose, at that gay beer parade which was still swinging along under the electric lights of Manhattan.
communists became violent toward the close of the year 1931. Taking advantage of the depression of general unemployment, the Reds organized numerous demonstrations. They swept down from all parts of the city of New York to the city hall. In order to keep the communists from invading the city hall and upsetting the peace and order of the whole city, it was necessary for the police to deal vigorously with them. Never pleasant to see men clubbed and roughed about, however misguided they may be, but all appeals and persuasions were wasted. In the case of use, the club or surrender to the riot. I am George Nye, the Quaker evangelist of Madison, Wisconsin. The great people of the United States of America are out exhibiting their menagerie. The Republican Party has paraded the elephant around the ring and fed him so much booze that already his stomach is contracting and he's about to lie down with a bellyache. The Democrat Party has paraded the jackass around the ring and fed him so much booze that he's liable to lie down in a drunken stupor. The Prohibition Party have always fed the goat on pure green grass and cold water. And now my slogan is uh, fire, fire, fire. I smell smoke. Get on the water wagon. Pitch the hose to the goat. And so with firm grasp, he sees the helm of the drifting ship of state took command of the darkest hour the nation had known for generations. A real American with three centuries of inspiring family tradition and brain and blood. <laughs> President Roosevelt can trace his love for the soil and rural life to his first ancestor, Claus Martens and Van Rosenbelt, and to 1649. That was a memorable year when the family came over from Holland and settled in New Amsterdam. Our president's branch of the family later moved up to Hudson to Dutchess County in the year 1818. And there the president first saw the light of day on January 30th, 1882. The home of his boyhood with its comfortable frame colonial house, its 500 acre farm, is little changed from the days when he was a babe in his mother's arms. Sarah Delano Roosevelt is the president's mother, a lovely and gracious lady whose old American family were merchants and whose fast clipper ships raced to and from China the romantic tea trade of the 60s. In the old Dutch Bible, she recorded the birth of her son, Franklin. And one wonders if she ever dreamed that the baby of three months she held in her arms would someday place his hand on that same old Bible and take the oath as President of the United States. It may well have been, for Sarah Delano Roosevelt may have had in happy motherhood the strange vision that sometimes descends upon the mothers of only sons, an instant's glimpse behind the veil of the future. And we have a word for it, that Franklin was an active and ambitious youngster who invariably assumed the leadership of his playmates in their boyhood sports. Even at nine, there is visible in his face the poise and confidence that goes with leadership. Brought up and educated in sane, simple, and thrifty ways, our president passed from boyhood into youth and entered the second cycle of his career. At 18, well grounded by private tutors, he was ready for university training and entered Harvard and paid his first respects to the man who founded this great university, John Harvard. He became editor of the College Daily, the famous Harvard Crimson, writing with a vigorous hand and putting pep into the once staid and conservative sheet. Franklin Roosevelt left his impress at Harvard. He was a good mixer, a member of many social clubs, played football, and was a member of the varsity rowing squad. Many a time he tugged to the sweep on the beautiful and historic Charles River, scene of the great annual boating duels between Harvard and Yale, and cheered with the crowds on observation train and shore as the crimson of fair Harvard and the blue of old Yale battled it out in one of their historic regattas. Childhood, the president has loved the water. At Harvard in those boat racing days, he began to acquire his wonderful naval library. There was a thrill of combat in those races on the Charles, which was dear to the heart of a real Roosevelt, a fighting Roosevelt. And even today, men who went to Harvard with Franklin Roosevelt recall his charming personality, his vigor and enthusiasm, 
his ability to get things done. He was a vital figure in all Harvard activities. Here we see him with his senior class group, and the time was close at hand to bid farewell to Fair Harbor. Out of college, he turned to the law for a career and entered the law school at Columbia University. And while absorbing Blackstone within these walls, he married Eleanor Roosevelt, his distant cousin, and a niece of President Theodore Roosevelt. As a young lawyer, he began his career in a time of change and tumult. The economic and social ideas of the country were changing rapidly. One of the seething movements of the period was the demand for the vote by women and the stirring campaigns of the suffragettes. In 1912, Franklin D. Roosevelt made himself a national figure by his support of Woodrow Wilson. Under Wilson's dynamic leadership, the country staged one of the most dramatic fights for the presidency in all its history. The great Teddy Roosevelt, leading his bull moose revolt against the Republican old guard, was delivering blazing speeches. He rolled up more than four million votes for himself, but Wilson won easily, supported by such enthusiastic lieutenants as young Franklin Roosevelt. William Howard Taft, defeated in the three-cornered race, maintained the famous Taft smile, and took his defeat like the good soldier of the state that he was. And on that historic 4th of March, 1913, 200,000 people attended the great ceremony at the Capitol, which was fated to begin a new era, tremendous consequences to America. And Franklin Roosevelt, among the guests of honor on the inaugural stand as the new Assistant Secretary of the Navy, felt his heart stirred by Woodrow Wilson's demand for the new freedom and took up his work in the spirit of devotion to his country. 1914, what volumes of drama and tragedy lie in those two words. War bursting over Europe, civilized nations gone mad, the great green host of the German Kaiser pouring through Belgium. stirred anxiously, uneasily. Throughout the nation, demand for preparedness was raised. In all the great cities, thousands marched in preparedness parade. City, vast crowds jammed the sidewalks as 140,000 people, 12 abreast, swept up the avenue with bands blaring patriotic airs and the stars and stripes waving proudly in the sunshine. Important world history is being made these days in London and elsewhere. New leaders, new ideas have seized the minds of men. Events are moving swiftly in the direction of progress, economic stability, and peace. Outstanding in the great forward steps toward world unity are the Geneva Disarmament Conference and the World Monetary and Economic Conference here in the British capital. In the new Geological Museum at South Kensington, uh, in these rooms which workmen are now fitting out for their significant role, the fate of civilization itself may well rest. And in these far-sighted strivings for universal good, two great leaders stand out. Two great leaders of two great English-speaking nations. Two men of widely separated antecedents, 
but of singularly similar viewpoints and leadership. Prime Minister J. Ramsey MacDonald of Great Britain and President Franklin Delano Roosevelt of the United States. Premier MacDonald was born in 1866 in the little Scotch town of Lossiemouth in Elgin County, far to the north on Maury Firth. He was of humble origin and is practically self-educated. At 19, he came to London to do secretarial work and a few years later found him active in the socialist movement, serving his apprenticeship at Soapbox Oratory in Hyde Park and Trafalgar Square and becoming noted in labor circles as an organizer and writer. Little did the nation suspect in those Victorian days that the lean, long-haired Scotch scribbler would one day be a world figure, secretary of the Labour Party for 11 years, and then its leader, member of the London County Council for four years, and then elected as a member of parliament. These were the steps by which he rose to high estate in the nation's affairs. The Labour Party's great success in 1923 resulted in his selection as Prime Minister. And as their majesties wrote to Parliament in the auspicious year of 1924, with all the famous trappings of age-old regal pomp and ceremony, the entire world marveled at the curious twist of British democracy that plucked from the masses, from the very bosom of anti-patriotic internationalism, a self-made battler against British conservatism, to be the king's man the creator of a ministry, the maker of government. Premier MacDonald's Scotch sagacity soon became paramount in all international debt parlors. In Paris, he is welcomed by Premier Ario on the eve of the Lausanne Conference. His stand on settlements and cancellation at Lausanne ring on the world. And again in Paris, he and Premier Ario confer at the critical moment when the French leader is facing the wreck of his ministry over the December war debt payment. And then came the Prime Minister's epical trip to Rome. General Balbo, Italian air minister, himself pilots the huge tri-motored hydroplane with the McDonnell party aboard from Genoa to Ostia. And there, for the first time on record, Premier MacDonald and Premier Mussolini meet on Italian soil, a meeting destined to result in the announcement of the famous Four Power Treaty, Europe's own peace pact, embracing Britain, France, Germany, and Italy. It is during this important conference in Il Duce's own office that the elements of Mussolini's recently adopted peace plan is drafted, a 10-year pact that now, months after its presentation, looms as one of the outstanding instruments of the era in world politics. As the originator of the MacDonald disarmament plan, the British Premier was the first European leader sought out by President Roosevelt after the great change in administration at Washington. Invited to confer with the American President prior to the Geneva and London parlors, the Premier and his gracious daughter journey to the United States, where they are received with honor and acclaim by the city of New York in the fleeting minutes they have to spend in New York waters. The eyes of America and of the world are on McDonald today as he lands, boards a train for Washington. The peace and probable prosperity of all nations are in the balance. This visit means much to the summer's parlor. And on those parleys rest the structure of modern civilization itself. An agreeable, almost a startling surprise awaits Premier MacDonald at the White House, the American presidential residence. Instead of expected stiffness and formality, the president and his charming wife are out on the front steps to greet with warmth and true American hospitality their guests from overseas. The prime minister long has been close to the hearts of the American public. His tribute to the forever nameless American fighting man whose heroic dust lies under the slab at their unknown soldier's tomb won their high regard. The self-educated Scotsman of the 80s has made a doctor of laws by George Washington University and gets a real thrill out of the collegiate mortarboard. 
on his visit to the majestic capital, home of the American Congress and the seat of government, he is accorded the courtesy of the United States Senate and addresses the lawmakers of our sister nation, winning great applause and praise by his apt and enlightening remarks. One of the highlights of his stay in Washington is his appearance at the National Press Club, the shrine of American newspaper dump. And hosts of the National Press Club. I am really uh, delighted to be your guest once again. We want the machinery of production and of consumption to begin to go round again. And we can't do that by any system of pure nationalist economics. <laughs> My American friend, if you want to come across a good nationalist, go to Scotland in order to find them. I'm proud of being a nationalist. I'm proud of my history. I'm proud of my culture. I'm proud of my kith and my kin. I'm proud of the part that we have played in the history of mankind. But if I translate that pride of mine, that nationality of mine, into nationalist economics, if I engage in the rather tragic delusion of imagining that a Scotland made economically self-contained is going to make its tribute to the world's wealth, then what I shall find is this, that I shall both impoverish myself and impoverish my neighbors outside my own boundaries. The United States, Great Britain, France, must protect themselves. We have been going through difficult times. What's the way to handle them? Agree how to get out of them. Happiness, contentment, enjoyed by large populations, living on high standards of life, can only be maintained by a freely flowing international experience. Change. And how we are going to devise that freely pro flowing exchange is to be the main purpose of the International Economic Conference. Other well-known diplomats arrive in Washington for preliminary talks with Roosevelt and with Cordell Hull, American Secretary of State, including Prime Minister Bennett of Canada, and Edouard Ariel, former Premier of France. His mission ended, Premier MacDonald says goodbye to Washington, having laid the groundwork for Anglo-American cooperation in the momentous days to follow. Days that are to startle the world with Roosevelt's appeal to all nations for immediate action on the MacDonald disarmament plan and for real constructive results at the London Economic Conference. And so the Premier is welcomed back to number 10 Downing Street by a nation enthusiastically impressed with the greatness of his efforts for world betterment. What manner of man is Roosevelt, the sudden idol and magic leader of the American people, whose first bold strides into world politics seem to herald the dawn after dark years of post-war turmoil? What is his history? 